Hi, I'm Fernando Ramirez from Sports Illustrated. You're listening to The War Zone. Let's get ready to rumble! Step into the war zone! 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 Friday night war zone! Friday night war zone! Hey yo, it's Phil Flames, I'm with Mike on the mic and Joe Morley. About to bring you more heat. Welcome to the war zone, you can have a floor seat. Watch them on your iPhone, watch them on your Galaxy. It's a sports debate show, straight up out of SoCal. Gather around the laptop, Friday nights it goes down. And we on the radio, coming to your locale. Got into the third round, better bring the smoke now. Step into the war zone. Step into the war zone. Step into the war zone. The war zone. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the war zone. I'm Joe Morley. This is Mike on the mic. And we got a special guest for you today. Mike, you're going to love this one. If you're a Charger fan, you guys probably already know who he is. This guy is the Charger reporter for Sports Illustrated, and primetime Deion Sanders himself once told him that his genetics were off the chain. Just look at that hair. Look at that hair, guys. Mr. Fernando Ramirez. I appreciate you guys for having me on. Yeah, that was a crazy uh, Super Bowl experience last year. Uh, God, it feels like it was forever ago, but just quickly, I mean, I was uh, I had just come back from the Shakira and J-Lo uh, press conference from the Super Bowl, so I, I like run back and I remember I was sweating. And I was like, okay, relax, calm down. Now let's go into NFL because NFL Network has tables set up and you get to talk to all their analysts and former players. So I remember I go to Dion and he goes, well, before you ask your question. And then I'm like, he just starts going off and everybody starts laughing. And it was funny because this last off season, I can't remember, um, I can't remember who the reporter was, but he asked me, hey, can you jump on my radio show? And I'm like, oh, yeah, for sure. He's like, and then on the radio show, he's like, I remember you. And I was like, well, from what? He's like, you were the one that Deion Sanders said that you had a great genetic. I was like, oh, yeah. He's like, you're the hair guy. I was like, that is that how I'm known? He's like, yeah, the hair guy. I was like, okay, let's do it. Hey, flaunt it if you got it. You know what I mean? Uh, yep, like, yep. <laughs> you got to love prime time. <laughs> and you got to love Chargers talk. Joe Morley, are you ready for this, man? Are you going to make it through this? I'm not ready for it. As a Raider fan, it's going to be uh, painful. But I'm, hey, I'm in getting the inside information. Oh. So take it back to John Gruden and the crew keeping, and let them know. Keeping your enemies close. I see. It's, it's smart. <laughs> <actually>. <laughs> but it's all good. Uh, yeah, man. I appreciate you joining us, Fernando. We're, Thank you for uh, having me on. I guess we're ready to get into some, some Charger talks, huh? Well, full I mean, force. I need to get more hyped. I, I, I can leave. I mean, if you're not hyped, I mean, I can, <laughs> I can take this energy somewhere else. Mike's hyped. Mike's oh hyped. yeah. <laughs> no, I know. I'm always hyped. Uh, I'm just like, who else can, who else can beat us and still come in third place this season? <laughs> I'm probably the only person on planet Earth with a Casey Hayward jersey. I gotta be it. That's probably why they. Every time you buy a jersey, it's time to get a new one, right? It's uh, doesn't yeah, it? Send, sends the players out. Yeah, I got Melvin Gordon jerseys in there too, but we don't we don't put those next to the other Chargers jerseys. He's not quite <laughs> welcome. Even Fernando laughed at that one. He's like, "Who bought that one?" <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, free agency is in full effect right now. You already know that. You're covering <laughs> everything. You're you're following them around uh, off the air. You said that you reminded us that hey. There was a time where players actually visited teams before they signed. Now it's like out the window. Now they're just signing as soon as they can. They have a tampering window, which is whatever. <laughs> Do we even believe that there's a tampering window? <laughs> but Chargers have Chargers have gone out there and they made a point to get some offensive linemen, help that young quarterback out. Are you liking the move so far? I mean, I think it was it was something that they needed to solidify. Last year, the offensive line was bad, and I mean, Justin Herbert threw or not threw. But he had thirty. He scored thirty six touchdowns, and that was with a with the one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. So for him to be able to do all that, that just shows how special the kid is. They didn't just go out and get offensive linemen. They got a leader in Corey Lindsley. We talked to him. We just actually just got off with him a little bit ago, and um and he he said that he was very impressed with what uh with what Justin Herbert brings to the table. He actually said that Brian Bulaga, the Chargers right tackle. Um, they used to be teammates in Green Bay. He said that that was a, one of the big reasons why he signed with the Chargers. And I believe it was the Cardinals, the Chargers, and the San Francisco 49ers that were all uh, – mainly the teams that were going after Lindsley. 
And the Chargers made the biggest uh, – he said that he believes in the vision of the Chargers. So, I mean, it, it's just positive what Brandon Sta – it seems like it's very positive what Brandon Staley's bringing to the Chargers and to the organization because it's working. And um, and Brian Bulaga has never played for Brian – or for um, – for Brandon Saley, he's never played for Joe Lombardi. This is all of the vision of what he's learned from those guys. So it's really interesting to see that that's how much of a big, how, what he thinks of the organization and the moves that they've made with their coaching hires. So it's definitely going to be very interesting. Um, Matt Feidler is uh, another guy who he said he loves to block up until the whistle. He says that he's a t he looks like a tough nosed guy. Both of these guys look like they're they're tough guys. And it's going to be really interesting. And Tom Telesco told us when they fired Anthony Lynn, we have to make a point of fixing this offensive line. And it's true because Tom pointed um, before the free agency, Tom pointed out to, and he said, what I didn't like our red zone offense. And I didn't like our, um, our, the way we were running the ball. Well, what comes with both of those, the offensive line has to be better. So, uh, and if he didn't like the red zone efficiency with well, his quarterback scoring 36 touchdowns, that means that he thinks that uh, he could have been up there. I mean, I thought in some of those games, Justin could have scored more touchdowns if he had more time. So we could, we probably could have seen him up there with the Aaron Rodgers' numbers uh, if if he would have had a halfway decent offensive line. But obviously, I'm getting ahead of myself, and I'm just uh, I'm just uh, kidding around, obviously. But but Justin's very impressive, and I feel like the Chargers know that they, they need to do two things. They need to get them weapons on offense and they need to get them an offensive line that can block for them. And the Chargers have already started doing that with these two signings. But I think this is far, um, I think it's, they still have so much more to go to improve the team overall as a whole. 100% agree. And I'm excited to see what Herbert does behind a little bit of a, a upgraded offensive line here. I think the Chargers probably are going offensive line in the first round also, and they may even still bring in another offensive lineman. We'll see, but they've already added two this offseason. Last year in free agency, the best move was made by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They needed a quarterback. They went out and got the best quarterback available, and look what happened. The Chargers needed most a center this offseason. That was all I was preaching all season last year and into this this year that we needed a center more than anything. And we go out and we get one of the best, maybe the best center. Joe, you football. heard that, right? He just compared right. Uh, he just compared Corey Lindsley to Tom Brady. Exactly. I, I don't know. if you Exactly. Heard it, Joe. Exactly. And a lot of people don't realize how it. important the center position is. And I think this is going to be the best move of the offseason for that reason. The Chargers went from having a bottom three center situation to a top three center situation. Big move by the Chargers. I, I think the reason why is because the offensive line is never noticed when they're doing their job. When they're doing their job, oh, all, all, all forward, let's go, let's keep on moving. When they're bad, they're noticeable. And the Chargers' mm -hmm. offensive line was noticeable last year. I mean, the, and what sucked was that Brian Bulaga was out for a lot of games. He had numerous injuries. I think there was like two games where three plays in, he was already out of the game. Mm -hmm. So it really hurt them. But I mean, there was, you know, you know what? I'm going to take you guys back to that uh, week four Chargers, Tampa Bay Buccaneers game. Justin Herbert had Brian Bulaga out. Austin Eckler got hurt. And, and I think he had, I think Trey Turner didn't play. And they had some other uh, injuries on the offensive line. Herbert was literally standing in the pocket facing two or three linebackers coming up to him. And he was waiting because he knew Tyron Johnson was going to be open for that 70 mm -hmm. or that 57 yard touchdown or uh, Jalen Guyton was going to get wide open for that uh, 70 yard touchdown. And he waited through the ball and then took that shot. That's the thing. You can't take those unnecessary. He can't take those unnecessary shots. Not, I'm not blaming him. Obviously I'm blaming, <laughs> I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm just saying the offensive line can't allow that to happen. And the thing is that we've seen – you saw what happened to Joe Burrow this year, unfortunately. He suffered a torn ACL, and I, it, that's, that doesn't fall on the offensive line. It's just a freak accident. Obviously, his offensive line, he was getting hit a lot. But that's what the Chargers need to avoid when it comes to Justin. There was games last year where I remember the Raider game in Las Vegas. No, it was the one in Los Angeles. Uh, Herbert throws a screen pass to Gabe Neighbors, the fullback. He takes a wicked shot, and I'm looking at him, and he's grabbing his knee, and I'm like, oh, no. But yeah. he was able to pop up and he was fine. Then against the Patriots at the towards the end of the game when they're already blown out 45 to zero, he takes a wicked shot in the chest. And I thought, ooh, is he okay? 
pops up. So there was times where he was taking shots and he was kind of on the ground. Obviously the TV would cut out and it would go to the commercial while he was like kind of getting up and waiting and limping and everything. So he was taking some crazy shots. So definitely you're right. I mean, the offensive line needed an upgrade. And the thing is that when uh, Matt uh, Filer, he's coming from being with Maurice Pouncey for a lot of years. Maurice Pouncey, we all know, is one of the best centers in the NFL and was an all-pro and everything. Now he's going with Corey Lindsay, and he said it. He said it today to us that um, that he felt like he really is going from an all-pro center to another all-pro center, and he feels like Corey's one of the best uh, centers out in the NFL. Obviously, he said he's the best. Uh, I'm not about it. He said he's the best center in the NFL. So it's going to be really interesting to see the way the Chargers, Joe Lombardi, and this offense really, really starts moving because Joe Lombardi told us what we're going to do is we're going to build around Justin. We're going to go with what Justin feels comfortable. Some other guys won't do that. Some other guys come in and say, hey, I want you to run my system. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. And that's the thing you can't have happen. You need to come in and you need to really mold your offense around what Justin liked last year. Some of the new wrinkles that you want to throw in there, and Justin had already said, I'm going to talk to Drew Brees. I'm going to reach out to him and see what to expect from Joe Lombardi. So I definitely offensive line. I know I kind of went on a different change, but offensive line, Corey Lindsay was a, a great signing for these guys and a, the biggest need that they had. Yeah. And, and if anyone, if anyone still has any doubts talking to you, Joe, about Justin Herbert, go and look for those plays that he just mentioned. Joe, do you just, Justin I'm made not, elite. I'm not doubting Justin Herbert. Justin oh, okay. made elite quarterback throws in those plays, getting murdered, throwing the ball 50 yards I mean, down the field, going across one side, throwing back to the fullback. Yeah, yeah something in his hands. Let yeah, me remind like, you who won me a championship belt. this year. I still think that's my fantasy league. league. Justin Herbert's right there on my belt. That's amazing. I had to put him on. He's on. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm a I'm a huge WWE guy, so I love I love belts. Oh, oh, that's a nice one. So I won my championship this year, and and I had I would tell people, and we told the story before. I had Justin Herbert as my fantasy quarterback this year, and I had to make the decision in the last weeks when the Raiders were playing him if I was going to start him against the Raiders or not. And I ended up starting him. Good choice. Won me my championship. No, let me ask you: Did you draft him, or did you sign him uh, when Tyrod went down with the or or after that Kansas City game? No, I picked him up off the free agency, yeah. So oh, I was wow. staying away from all chargers why Tyrod Taylor was the quarterback, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, had a, let's move Keenan on. Allen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel you. I know what you I, I know what you mean. I like Tyrod. I'm not we're not bashing Tyrod Taylor. Oh, no, I like no, what I, he does, no. but it was a totally different offense. Let, let me ask you this too. You yeah. you guys lost Hunter Henry, you lost Jenkins. Um wasn't it Perryman? I believe is gone now. Yeah. And then you're bringing in Jerry Cook. We all know Jerry Cook. He's been in the division before. Uh, and so I'll ask. It was a big loss for Hunter Henry for the team just because of the way he blocked. He was underrated as a blocker. And you know what? I remember two, three years ago, he told me, I want to get better at blocking. He knew that, uh, that that's a big part of the, the, you know what's funny? Back in the early stages of the NFL, the tight end position was about blocking, being an extra blocker out on the field. Yeah, they go out and run and run some routes and stuff, but it wasn't like it is today. Kellen Winslow really maximized it, and I feel like he's not talked about enough when we talk about elite tight ends, but he really maximized it. Shannon Sharp improved it. Tony Gonzalez mastered it, and then Antonio Gates basically finished it off. And those, those to me are the godfathers of the tight end position, those four guys. Mike Ditka, I mean, I'm, I might throw in there just because I've seen some of his film from the early stages, and he was a pretty big uh, – he was a beast at uh, tight end. But really, what they did was maximize it. So Hunter was really the protege of, of Antonio Gates, but the thing is that his price tag – and then I, I feel like if we would have had the original cap, which would have been, I think, thirty million dollars more, or if uh, a little bit more. I think the charge would have re-signed Hunter, but it was just too steep. You saw what the Patriots paid him. I mean, that was a that was literally a king's ransom for a tight end. Um, so I believe that the Chargers like Jared Cook. Jared Cook, I know he's thirty four, but people are underestimating him. I think. Uh, I think he can really. He still has a lot left in the juice. He burned the Chargers last year for a forty one yard touchdown. So I think the Chargers were really impressed by that. The other thing is, is uh, Chris Harry, the Chargers team reporter, he sent out a good uh, stat yesterday. Travis Kelsey has 26 touchdowns in the last three seasons. Second, uh, second, uh, second tight end is Jared Cook with 22. 
So Jared Cook is really going to be a red zone weapon, I think, for for um, for Justin Herbert. You add Donald Parham to the mix. Parham is a guy that the team likes. You can tell they kept him. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he grows as a tight end. He's six foot eight. He had that play last year against the Raiders where um, where he dropped uh, where he dropped um, not dropped, but like the cornerback or the safety made a really good play, and and the ball slipped out of his hand. So definitely, um, definitely, he's going to be a guy that needs to improve. I still think the Chargers need to go out and get another tight end, um, whether it's in free agency, whether it's in the draft. I still feel like they need another tight end. Now, I, and I threw it out to one of my buddies, Gil Manzano, who works for the Orange County Register. He covers the team, too. And he told me, well, I guess the uh, Zach Ertz uh, the Zach Ertz thing is gone because I, I had been told that Zach Ertz really wanted to be a Charger because – he would be coming home and I'm like, wait, it's not over. He's like, why? And I'm like, why not both bro? And that's what I always tell him. I'm like, why not both? I was like, they can, they can, they can manage getting Ertz and but obviously not trading. It would have to be through free agency if he gets released, but I'm like, why not? I mean, attack it with Zach Ertz. Can you imagine Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Zach Ertz, uh, Jared Cook and Austin Eckler? I mean, you'd have a mismatch for defenses. Obviously, I mean, I, I'm not a GM and I only play one on Madden, but uh, but definitely, um, definitely it was a loss for them. But hey, Jared Cook is still good. He's still athletic. He can still move. And he had his best season under Frank Smith, who is now the Chargers offensive line coach and run game coordinator. So I'm sure him, Joe Lombardi, they're going to get together and they're going to maximize what Jared uh, Cook can still do and the way he can still ball. Yeah, he's yeah, going to bring some consistency. Go ahead, yeah, I, we had Jerry Cook in, in Oakland when we were there, and you know him and Derek Carr were were right on it. They were one and two. So every quarterback he goes to, they always fall in love. He, I mean, look at the quarterbacks he's he's played for: Aaron yeah. Rodgers, Derek Carr, Drew Brees. Now he's going with Justin Herbert. It's a good a good one. And and like you said, yeah, it's not over. I could yeah. if they want to get Zach Ertz, they want to get another tight end. The league is going towards more of a two tight end set. Yeah, uh, you know, getting those tight ends because not only you put them down, you can actually spread them out. And, th and that's what Jared Cook is. Jared Cook's not just one of those guys that line up on the line and he blocks or goes out. You can line him outside and he'll take off on somebody too. So And, he, and he's very athletic. I think he's sneaky athletic. I still remember, you know what play comes to my mind, speaking of Aaron Rodgers, that play against the Cowboys, where the Cowboys were down, they came back, they were trying to make some noise, and the game was tied. And he hits Jared. I forgot that he hit Jared Cook for that, that sideline pass where they thought oh it was incomplete they go and review it and it was complete so i mean it's one of those things where the guy's athletic the guy can ball and the guy's gonna bring a lot to the chargers offense and who knows maybe he takes over mentoring donald parham whoever the next tight end that comes in if it's a young tight end who they decide to the draft maybe um he decides to mentor him too that's the thing that people forget when you get a veteran tight end like jared cook he could help mentor guys and obviously antonio gates is still around the organization he works for uh the chargers uh right now so antonio gates is another guy that um tight ends can reach out to and really get some knowledge from because antonio i mean he's seen everything and i remember back when they were in san diego and even in la sometimes i would sit there and i'd talk to him and we would talk about all kinds of things and it would be and I'd really ask him about the game of football and he'd be like, bro, the tight end position I have to do. And he would explain it to me and he'd go into like deep conversations and I'd be like, oh, wow. Like really like it's dynamic. Everything that he has to learn. He's like, I have to learn obviously what the offensive line's doing, but at the same time, I have to learn about going out uh, receiving and all this stuff. So it was really interesting to really get into the mind of a, of a future hall of famer. Cause I mean, to me, he's a, a no doubt slam dunk first ballot hall of famer because of everything that he brought to the game. And he, right now he's the, I feel like every tight end has one record with them and he has a touchdown record right now. I think he passed and I think he beat uh, Anthony Gonzalez by one or two touchdowns. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I think it was well, two I mean, touchdowns. I, I actually thought Gronk was going to pass him up for it, but then obviously Gronk uh, retired for, I think a season or a season and a half. But, and by the way, Gronk lied to me at the Super Bowl last year in Miami. <laughs> I remember I asked him, I'm like, Hey Gronk, like, are you comfortable with it? He's like, yeah, man. He's like, I'm comfortable with being retired. He's like, I don't want to come back. Like, I'm fine. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Couple of months, a couple of, or a couple of weeks later, Oh, Gronk is traded to the bucks. I'm like, you lied to me into my face when I asked you. No, but it's <laughs> he took his 24 seven championship belt away from him. Man, <laughs> 
I'll, I'll tell you one thing. If he would have had it there that day, I might have done. I would have looked for a referee somewhere, and I might have done that. I, I would have gone up and tried to take it from him. Honestly, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for WWE to call me and be like, "Hey, we'd love for you to win the 24/7 championship, or the way our uh, truth calls it, 27 47 48 uh, championship." I, I I'd be down. I, I love all that stuff. Hey, well, I mean, we went from Chargers to Wrestle real yeah. quick, but <laughs> WrestleMania should be in LA pretty soon, right? Yeah. Oh, so they moved it. So that's. So I have a picture right here uh, with Becky Lynch. They were announcing the WrestleMania. Um, and for people who are, are listening, maybe on Spotify or something else, it's uh, it's right behind me on my left shoulder blade. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I got a picture with Becky Lynch. Uh, a buddy of mine took it while I was asking her a question. And that was when they were announcing that WrestleMania this year was going to be in L.A. But now they pushed it back. So next year it's going to – this year it's going to be in Tampa – Next year, it's going to be in Dallas. And then the following year, it's going to be at SoFi. And I remember I had, uh, somebody, or I don't know if it was me or somebody else, somebody had asked Roman Reigns about potentially fighting The Rock at, uh, at LA. He's like, dude, where else would you rather have me face The Rock? And he even <laughs> cut a promo. He's like, Dwayne, Rock, you know, bro, like, look at this stadium out here. We can do this. He's like, let's tear this place up. I was like, dude, I was getting hyped. I was like, dude, can you imagine? I mean, obviously, The Rock's a, a movie star and everything, but I would have loved Roman Reigns versus The Rock in L.A. That would have been something. Yeah, I've been to two WrestleManias in my life, and I was waiting. I was like, oh, that's coming to L.A. I want to go there. I want to take my kids. I want to do all this because WrestleMania week, just building oh. up to it. I don't know. I've never been to a Super Bowl week, and hopefully we'll get that next year in L.A. Yeah. Um, but I want to go to both. I, the, the I've, whole never, I've never been to a wrestling. I've never been to WrestleMania. And I've never been to a wrestling week. But everybody keeps on telling me that it's like it's something crazy. So I definitely, I definitely want to experience it soon. I mean, hell, maybe I'll go to Dallas next year and and try and experience it because I mean, it sounds like it is. It's something. It's a different monster. Oh yeah, and we'll we'll, we'll hop back onto the Charger thing right <laughs> yeah, now. But, <laughs> re, hey, wrestling fans pop out of nowhere. It's it's crazy because we all grew up. Oh, a lot of people grew up watching the old school stuff. Even like yesterday, I'm just driving home and I'm watching old clips of wrestling, and it just catches your your eyes how great it was. You, I don't even mean to. It pops up on my YouTube. Like when I open YouTube, I'm like bored, waiting for like my sister to go into Starbucks. I'm like looking on YouTube and I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, oh, Undertaker versus uh, Razor Ramon or Undertaker against uh, Ric Flair and stuff like that. So I start watching and I'm like, okay. Then it's like, oh, best insults from Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah I yeah, definitely have to listen to that. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm one of those guys that just like, I get distracted easily. So when I see something like that, I'm like, oh yeah, let's go ahead and watch it. Yeah. I had the Rest Jeff Jarrett one pop up where he's walking across the ring doing his little strut oh. and Stone Cold runs in, stuns him, and then does the strut after him. It's like oh, that is hilarious. I remember perfect. That. That's a great that, one. That 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 was the really the golden age of wrestling, honestly. And I mean I, guys have done their best ever since then, but it's just it, it captivated, I think, the whole country that that era, the the hardcore the, the attitude era. You were too young, Mike. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I watched all of it though afterwards. I've got my little WrestleMania tapes sitting exactly. on my desk. Actually, the 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 wrestling has followed me my entire life because my Bro, actual when the, glass, when the glass broke, you knew. Like, stuff... <laughs> I, and I can't say it, but I'll say it like this: stuff was about to go down. <laughs> so... Have you ever you ever seen the old clip of Booker T and Stone Cold fighting in the grocery store? Yeah, yeah. that happened in my hometown, uh, and it's actually. My in-laws actually live like less than a mile away from that store. That is hilarious. And so every time I see it, I'm like, I, I try to cry like Booker <laughs> T, like, <"Ugh."> what? <laughs> I was at I was at one night stand here in San Diego, and I was getting popcorn, and all of a sudden I see Umaga and Jeff Hardy like running, like, and I'm like, whoa, and like I see it, and like they're running, like they were doing a, a false count anywhere. And I'm like, oh, crap, this is awesome. So, like, you just see him wrestling right there. And I'm like, I mean, obviously our phones were crappy back then, so I couldn't take a video or anything. But I'm like, dude, this is awesome. And, like, Umaga throws him into, like, the men's restroom, then grabs him, throws him <laughs> into another door. I'm like, this is hilarious. This was awesome. I mean, obviously you see it, like, I was in the nosebleeds because I was a kid. But, like, it was awesome to just see them, like, while I'm getting popcorn, see them running right across from you and uh, and getting hit. So, but definitely let's go back to that Charger talk because I, I – I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want you to lose viewers because I'm talking wrestling. 
Hey, I think we might gain viewers. Everybody exactly. loves wrestling. <laughs> like WWE, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Speaking about I've WWE, always, I've always loved that. <laughs> I'll go cool. back to WWF. I like that old name. There you go. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, we had a whole segment on AEW. Oh, yeah. really? So, I haven't checked it out. Is it is it good? Is it? It's okay. It's okay. The initial hype was a little bit. Uh, I watched the, the first three bit. weeks, and then I just couldn't. I'm like, I'm so invested. Yeah. And I mean, I don't watch WWE. I watch every WWE pay-per-view. Yeah. I don't watch SmackDown. I don't watch Raw. I watch it like, the you know, their clips. The yeah, three little highlights. Clips. That's all I need. So I, I watch the clips and all that stuff, and that's it. But every pay per view, I will watch it. And now, like, I guess they're on Peacock, so yeah. I need to yeah. jump on that Peacock to to watch <laughs> WrestleMania and Fast Lane and whatever else. Uh, I, just remember, I just remember the old days when it was the Royal Rumble, No Way Out, and then WrestleMania. Yeah, and now no. it's like they try and fit in three pay per views in between the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. And I'm like, okay, dude, I don't need all this. Like, just hype up WrestleMania all the way, but. It's because they caught on that everybody loves Royal Rumble because Royal Rumble catches your attention, oh my God. Dude, and then you're last, you're there now. You're invested for until WrestleMania. Yeah, last year a quick story. So last year when Kobe Bryant passed away, I was on my way to um I was on my way to Miami for Super Bowl week, and I mean Kobe honestly like he was a great human being. I always I met him there at Chargers Park uh, or at Chargers uh, there in Costa Mesa where they have their facility, and I met him. Great human being. I mean he would talk to me and everything. And, um, so it really hurt when he, and I mean, it felt like an uncle had passed away or, and all that. So it was really sad. And I remember I was in my hotel room and I'm like, you know what I'm going to watch. I didn't feel like doing anything. I didn't want to go out. So I'm like, you know what? I'll watch the back end of the Royal rumble. When edge came out, I got goosebumps and I was like, Oh my God. I'm like it. That was the first time I had smiled all day. Like when, when that happened, and I'm like, oh my god! Like eternally, I'll always love that clip just because of it when he comes out. Just because it had been such a crap day, and not just for Kobe, but everybody involved when mm -hmm. when that had happened. And like sometimes I'll just watch that random clip of Edge coming out just to get those goosebumps back. But definitely, um, I've definitely always loved wrestling and uh, and all that. But yeah, let's get back to that that Charger talk. <laughs> no, that's cool. Sport sports moments and lifting people up is what. Uh, what I think sports is all about, and one hundred percent. But we'll get to uh, to the man now, the the main event over there in Sandy. In the, oh, I said almost oh, said San oh, Diego. Oh, 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 almost said it, huh? Oh, in Los I'm Angeles <laughs> now. <laughs> well, Brandon Staley, the new coach. You mentioned him a couple times. How players haven't played for him yet, but are already you know basically starting to respect them. Uh, and then you got you said Joe Lombardi. You mentioned him a couple times. How big of a difference do you think they are going to make on the culture here in uh, in Los Angeles? I think Brandon Saley already has being the the offensive coordinator of the or the defensive coordinator of the Rams. I feel like he already has kind of like his. I feel like he already knows kind of what to expect, but um, but Brandon, I mean, he everything that I've heard is positive. I haven't heard one negative thing about him, and I mean, any other time that the Charger had hired a coach, I had asked around, and you'd heard some positives, some negatives here, stuff here, stuff there. And with him, it's like, it's all positive. People like literally are all about Brandon Staley. So it's going to be really interesting to see the way, the way he's able to, um, the way he's able to like maximize uh, the potential of this team. Cause that's what people say that he has a different way of coaching. And that's the thing. I remember um, I we were like, he told us, I want to build relationships with my players, but at the same time, I want them to coach. I, so my bad. So basically what I've heard about Brandon Saley is that, um, is that basically, yes, he's a coach, but he also listens. That's the thing that uh, players really like about him. You guys know who Jalen Ramsey is. You guys know how Jalen Ramsey is. Jalen Ramsey gave a huge, a huge stamp of approval when he spoke about him and called him the best defensive coordinator he had ever had. To me, that was incredible i mean it was like okay that means that he really does respect who brandon saley is as a coach now with joe lombardi i don't know how much i expect the offense to change just because it's the same players coming back but i want to see what he's able to do because i mean and i'm going to be honest he, it, the last time he was an offensive coordinator it didn't go well <coughs> excuse me he was in Detroit and it did not go well. He had Matthew Stafford, Megatron. They couldn't get their run game started. The offensive line wasn't that good. Um, they didn't, I, I believe they didn't make the playoffs and he was fired two years into, 
or maybe a year and a half into his tenure. So honestly, it was one of those things where it didn't go well. But now I think he learned from his mistakes with the going back to New Orleans, being the quarterback's coach for Drew Brees. And I feel like he has a better understanding and a better grasp of what he needs to do now as a charge offensive coordinator. Because it's the way I see the charge offensive coordinator position now is guys are either going to get hired or fired. And I know it, it usually happens for everybody, but I'm saying like, if Vince, if I keep on calling him Vince, if Joe Lombardi, cause that's his grandfather. If Joe Lombardi is able to take this offense to new heights, he could be looking at a head coaching position next year. If this offense just completely flames out, he could be looking for a new job next year. So it's going to be one of those things where it really can be, if you take this offense to the top and they're the number one ranked offense, they're killing it. Justin's in the MVP discussion. They make the playoffs. Joe Lombardi next year could be a head coach. And that's what Brandon Staley told us. I understand what comes with it. Hell, he's he's seen it with McVay. Dude, the um, the quarterback's coach, McVay, Zach Taylor, gets the, hired as the, the head coach in Cincinnati. They, they literally are like, they literally grab anything they can from, uh, I mean, teams around the league are grabbing any Sean McVay guy they can to see if they can harness that offense. I mean, Matt LaFleur, we, we see what he's doing right now with Green Bay, but I feel like that's literally what teams are trying to do. And and I feel like Brandon Staley really understands that if the offense succeeds, Joe Lombardi could be um, could be leaving. But I like I said, I like the message that Joe Lombardi brought the first time that we spoke to him. Well, the only time was we're going to build around Justin. So I think that's going to be a huge positive. I feel like what the Chargers did last year, I feel like Anthony Lynn and Shane Steichen at times held Justin back and they kind of simplified the offense. And it's kind of like, so let me, let's go back to last year. He plays against Kansas city. I thought, wow, impressive debut. You only came in. Wow. That Panthers game. I'm like, Oh, I'm like, is he the guy? Is he not the guy that damn, that damn Tampa Bay game really opened my eyes. And I'm like, Oh, wow. This kid's, this kid might be the real deal. That New Orleans Saints game the week later, I was like, yep. Uh, going into the bye week, I told I, I told people, I'm like, this kid is the real deal. And coming out of college, I actually had him at, ranked as the second best quarterback coming out of college. I like Justin. I thought if you send Justin to Alabama, if you send Justin to LSU, I'll say it. I think he might've done better than uh, Burrow. And I think he might've done better than Tua. I just think Justin is a smart guy. He had... He won the Heisman for intelligence in academia in college. He's a smart guy. I feel like Oregon's offense kind of bored him at times. He didn't have the same skilled players that Tua and Joe Burrow had around them. So I feel like once he got to the NFL, it's like, oh, it's more complex. I feel like that's the thing. They need to keep on challenging Justin to learn more, to do stuff, mm -hmm. and really complex the offense so he can really understand it. In my opinion, I feel like what they're really going to do this offseason is is Brandon Staley and him are going to get together kind of like Bill Belichick and Tom Brady did. They're going to go after every single game that Justin played last year. And Brandon's going to help him as a former. And this is the thing. Brandon Staley is a defensive coordinator who used to play quarterback. Mm -hmm. So he understands how the quarterback were. And he only played in college. But I mean, hey, respect where respect is because I, I couldn't have played college ball. So um, I feel like they're going to sit down. He's going to analyze every single game that Justin played. And he's going to explain to him what the defenses are doing. Because to me, yes, uh, Justin had a great rookie season, but he did struggle. He struggled against Miami. He struggled against uh, the pit, the New Orleans. He struggled against That's the New it. England Patriots. <laughs> the New England Patriots. And he struggled against the Buffalo Bills. All three of those teams are in the AFC East. He might have to see them uh, in the playoffs, maybe uh, down the line. And he will see the Patriots this year, though. But he definitely will sit down and analyze it to them. So the way that the that the those three AFC teams were coming at him were with the zero uh, coverage. So they disguise a lot of what they were doing. They'd sometimes be in zero coverage with men, no safeties behind. So Justin would look, but then they would come in blitz. Or sometimes they would disguise it, look like they're zero, and they jump back into their defense. And that really was kind of throwing Justin for a loop a little bit. So I feel like literally the Justin's going to benefit from Brandon. I think Brandon's going to benefit from Justin. So I really am interested to see the way this dynamic goes. The last time the Chargers had a really good team was when they had a defensive coordinator as their head coach. And that was RIP to Marty Schottenheimer. 
14 and two. They had a great squad that he, Marty Schoenheimer literally built a very good squad. And then John Butler, obviously G GM at the time, they had built a really good squad. And I feel like that's what the charge really need to do right now is build up the squad, build up the defense, build up the offense to really attack it and build up that special teams. Cause wow, that special teams was not very good last year. And, and I think uh, Darius Swinton, the new special teams coach has a lot of work to do because that special teams last year was atrocious. And I mean, they re-signed Michael Badgley and I think they've re-signed Ty Long too, the punter. But last year they came in with no competition in training camp. I think that needs a change. Mm -hmm. I feel like they need to bring in another kicker. I think they need to bring in another punter and really challenge those guys because those guys last year were not very good at their um, at their job. Well, it seems like there's something going wrong on special teams every single <laughs> week. I've been preaching it. The Chargers were some good like coaching – yeah, the Chargers were just some better coaching decisions and a healthy Derwin James away from being a 10 or 11 win team last season with a rookie quarterback who came in, you know, with five minute warning that he was going to be a starting I, I quarterback. I don't know if I would go that far. Well, no, and that far in this instance, they blew leads against Tampa Bay, New Orleans, and um, and Denver. If they win those three games, they're 10 and six. Exactly. So I think I, I know Derwin would have helped tremendously. But I think based off of what I saw last year, they could have been a playoff team without that. Exactly. The thing is that the play calling got very conservative in the second half and the defense was getting exhausted because the offense went conservative. Mm -hmm. That's what I've never understood about coaches. I've always been one of those guys that I, I would rather and, and I would rather go and just knock their heads off completely mm -hmm. than let them hang around because any team you can let hang around, they're going to come back and they'll throw it. I mean, Drew Locke and, and the Broncos came back on you. Like, that was exactly that was a terrible game. I thought right there Gus Bradley was going to get fired, but the Chargers decided to keep him. Um, but I literally – I and the, the problem is that the Chargers had key players out at certain times in that Denver game. Joey Bosa goes out with a concussion. Casey Hayward goes out with an ankle injury. I believe it was an ankle. In New Orleans, Joey Bosa was only, uh, I think, 50%. And yet he was the one wrecking the most havoc on New Orleans. And um, and in Tampa, it was just the defense. Or it was that fumble by Joshua Kelly that really turned mm -hmm. everything around for Tampa going into halftime. So you just point out little little dumb mistakes that the Chargers really need to cinch up. And it feels like Brandon Saley really knows what this team needs to do to really get back. Well, I can't say get back to being a playoff team because they haven't been one in a long time. But this is an interesting stat that I, I, I hadn't even noticed. The last time the Chargers won the division Ladani was Ladanian Tomlinson's last season as a Bolt. So Dang. Tom Flesco has never won a, a <laughs> as a general manager. That's right, AFC West. <laughs> That's a long time ago. That's a long time ago. That Wait, Buffalo game is another I'm one. Ask you, I'm going to ask you, and I'm not trying to take a shot at all. Have the Raiders won the division in the last uh... – See, there you go. There you no, go. No, no, no. No, no, I'm, I'm, be I'm being serious. I'm being honest. <laughs> has it been a while? Because you it's guys been a while. The did they? Oh no, no, no! Kansas what, City, Can... what, no. What? When you guys played Houston, it was as a wild card team. Yeah, had... it was. Has it been so since that, Super Bowl? that was? I want to say it was since the Super because they've only had one winning season in the last sixteen years. <laughs> no, and I swear to God, I wasn't taking a shot. No, no, remember, it's cool. I remember the last ten years, it's been Broncos, Chiefs, Broncos, Chiefs. So I couldn't remember. And now that you you mentioned it, yeah, it's been a while. Okay, I know as a Raider fan, it's it's tough. It's tough sometimes, but we're. I, mean, uh, I hope John Gruden was listening to what you were saying earlier. Hey, keep your foot on the gas pedal. That's I don't. I'm I'm with you. I don't get why coaches get it. A ten point lead is not safe anymore, like it used to be. To the me, 10, it, my bad. Yeah. So real quick, I feel like we still have older coaches who in the '80s and '90s would do that, and those leads were safe. But now the way you Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert. Tom Brady, these guys can score at a drop of a hat. You guys saw, like, in the a in the NFC Championship, it looked like the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were going to kick a field goal to go into halftime. And, no, he's able to compete it to Scotty. Uh, he gets it to Scotty Miller, and he scores a touchdown with only, I think, it was like 15, 20 seconds left. So, literally, you can score so quickly mm -hmm. in today's NFL that I, I truly am I'm, – I'm one of those guys that I've never understood why put it on ice – the way you ice it is by keep on you keep on scoring. That's why when people were pissed off at Bill Belichick a couple of years ago when he had that high, the high scoring Randy Moss uh, offense, when everybody was so frustrated, why is he running up the score? He's running up the score so that crap doesn't happen to him. 
So, I mean, I've never understood why people got mad at it at running up the score. I mean, I understand. Okay. If you're, if you're blowing a team out by like 30 in the fourth quarter, okay. That's the time they kind of do it. But when you're up only 17 going into the fourth quarter, I understand why you try and go up 20 by 24 points because you really need to put your foot or you really need to knock the guys out and end the team, the opposing team to really get the victory and, and get out of there uh, clean. Yeah, the Chargers be going to the third quarter and be taking their foot off the gas pedal. <laughs> like, damn, guys, we got a half of a game to play still. I forgot to mention that you guys were one overturned call away from being the Raiders last year, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I, I was very surprised they went back and they looked at it. I honestly thought they were going to end the game because of the way the Chargers had celebrated. Yeah. I was like, oh, they're going to end the game and that's it. And when I saw that they went back and they were going to look at it, I'm like, oh, wow. And then I remember I saw the ball, like, kind of tuggle. I was like, ugh. I'm like, what a bad break, because that might have changed. I mean, I'm not saying it would have changed completely, but that could have kind of changed the Chargers season a little bit. But, um, oh, but yeah, I've always I'll been be- I've always been of that mindset. I don't understand why coaches take their foot off the gas if they know how talented quarterbacks are, how talented offenses are, and hell, even the defenses can score sometimes with a with a fumble. I, I, to me, I feel like teams are pick sixing and uh and um scoop and scoring more now than they were in the past yeah because of all these plays yeah i texted him right after that happened too right after we had just scored scored the game winning touchdown i was like ah you like that and and then he texted me back like i knew he didn't catch that you didn't know (laughs) i knew it it. i knew it 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 looked like a touchdown in, in fast motion you can only tell when they slowed it down and zoomed in on the little small little area where you can see the ball just barely. Yeah, he really ground. looked like he had it in his hands, yeah. a zoomed out version, and so he really does go down and he drops it. I was like, oh wow. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I felt so bad for him too. That he, game was heartbreaking. I had faith the whole time. I had faith the whole time. <laughs> hey, that corner, whoever that corner, that safety is, I can't remember his name right now, but wow, was he that was a very impressive what it was, he did. It was Mullen, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I want to say it was Mullen, but I didn't want to. Not I don't want to be wrong again. I've already been one. Twenty-seven, the wrong ones. 27, <laughs> 27 is Mullen, yeah. Mullen, yeah. I think it might have been him. Yeah, yeah, I think it was him. That game in the Buffalo Bills game hurt my soul too, just because we should have won that one too. And Joey Bosa had a career day, and I'm such a freaking big. I watched that game's highlights. The, <clears> the Joey Bosa was mic'd up for that, yeah. and Joey Bosa was an animal on the field and yelling while he's playing that he's an animal on the field. Yeah, Joey is Joey is something else. And I remember when he came in his rookie year and everything, and, and the more I've gotten to know him, um, he's honestly a great human being. You know what's funny is that uh, people call me the Joey Bosa whisperer because Joey and I talk sometimes. Like, we're, I'm standing in the locker room. I mean, when we were able to stand in the locker room, and Joey and I would just start talking about random stuff, and people thought he was giving me info. I'm like, no, like, all I'm talking to Joey about is Star Wars. Like, because the new Star Wars had just come out. And he's like, hey, what'd you think about the new one? I was like, I thought it was trash. And he starts laughing and he's like, uh, he goes, he's like, I thought it was terrible too. I'm like, yeah, I'm not a fan. I was like, the originals to me can't be beat. And he's like, dude, exactly. But we keep on doing all this stuff. So not to bore you guys with Star Wars stuff, but um, <laughs> but literally like I just to see the way Joey is, when the way Joey is off the field is not the way he's on the field. It's completely different. Like. Joey love like the one thing that Joey loves is helping kids. So anytime the Chargers have anything to go to Children's Hospital events like that, Joey's always one hundred percent in because he loves helping kids out and, and brightening their day. He told me about this kid that he had met a couple of years ago, um, and I think it was a Make a Wish. I can't remember what it was, but Joey and him hit it off. They played Madden the whole time, and Joey's like, I I gave him my number. He gave me his. We text and sometimes I'll jump online and play Madden with him and we'll just have a lot of fun. And I'm like, wow, that's incredible. I mean, you just never hear about stuff like that really um, from players. But, you know, when you get to really meet these players and talk to them one on one, you're just you get impressed by them because of everything that they bring, everything that they can do. So I'm honestly very impressed when I hear um, when I hear some of these guys tell me uh, their stories and everything that they do. Great. My wife has a crush on Joey Bosa. I'm sure this is going to help out a lot, finding out that he's just a great human being all around. I feel bad for you. <laughs> yeah, this, this just made him like a – she's going to put the picture up in the living room and everything now. She's probably going to get you a gym membership and be like, I want you to look like Joey Bosa. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, I'm going to need Good some luck. Help. Dude, dude is a monster. You know, it's funny, speaking of that, when we were talking – so 
uh, Lindsley, he was with, um, he was a, a fifth year senior when Joey was a freshman at Ohio state. And we asked him about him today. And he's like, dude, that guy was a beast from the get go. And we're like, really? He's like, we saw him walk in and we're like, holy crap. We're like, this kid is something else. And uh, he just said, he, everybody was impressed that everybody, some of the seniors were like, that kid's going to be a beast when he's, um, when he's in the NFL. And he's like, I'm so happy that Joey's been able to turn that, or, turn that into, he's one of the best uh, defensive ends in the NFL. And I feel like Joey really doesn't get uh, all the love and recognition that he deserves. I think to me, Joey Bose is one of the top three uh, pass rushers in the NFL, but I mean, that's just me. <laughs> I don't know how other people feel, but that's just, in my opinion, Joey Bosa is one of the best out there in the NFL and you probably won't find anybody. Well, I mean, you'll find a couple of guys that are at that level, but it's really hard to get some, something like that, especially in today's age with how the offense is uh, managed and how much they score. Yeah. yeah when he's a hundred percent, I think, I, I think I'm with you that he is very underrated. People know his name, but with the injuries and stuff like that, playing in for the chargers, some people forget, just like Derwin James. If Derwin James was on the field, we might see one of the greatest players in defense. And Mike will attest to that because Mike loves Derwin James, but he's never on the field either. No, and, and you know what? I, I think I, I, I think I saw the other day, him and Joey Bosa have only been on the field for 12 games in three seasons. Yeah, yeah. Three seasons. yeah three seasons. So, honestly, man – I'll tell you guys what, last year in training camp, holy sh stuff. Um, <laughs> I saw uh, I, my, my two favorite camp battles were Keenan Allen against uh, Derwin James. Derwin, I mean, Keenan will say he was holding. Man, Derwin was, he could be an all-pro corner if he really wanted to. Um, Derwin's a beast. Um, but I was watching him, and then – the other camp battle was Drew Tranquil and Hunter Henry. Man, that one was impressive. And Drew Tranquil, to me, was going to take the next step forward this last year, and he was really going to turn himself into, I'm not saying a Pro Bowl linebacker, but something equivalent to where he, his talent is shown. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely am very excited to see what Derwin brings this offseason. I've talked to him a couple of times, um, and I asked him, I'm like, how are you doing mentally? Like, Because mean, physically, we all know, but mentally – and he just puts a smile on his face and he's like, I'm fine, bro. Like, I understand that injuries happen. And he said he really leaned on Melvin Ingram and Keenan Allen to really help him through this time. Because uh, Melvin Ingram, his second year, tore his ACL. And that dude was an animal. I remember he came back uh, halfway through that year or like towards the back end of that year. And he starts making plays for these guys. And then they go into the playoffs against Cincinnati. Yeah, Cincinnati. He gets an interception against uh, Andy Dalton. And he was just a beast. I couldn't believe that. He tore his ACL in May and in November, he was back on the field. Yeah. So that was incredible. But uh, obviously Keenan Allen at the beginning of his career, I remember everybody's like, he's so talented, but he's so injury prone. And that's the thing. Some guys get label, uh, labeled injury prone, but then they come back and they make a huge impact and people forget and don't talk about him anymore. So I really feel like Derwin this year is really going to surprise a lot of people. I'm very interested to see the way Brandon Saley is going to use him to me. I feel like Derwin should be the uh, the po uh, positionless player. Mm -hmm. I feel like I and I feel like that's what the Chargers are going to use him this year. He won't say it. Brandon Staley won't say it. I feel like that's what he's going to do. He's going to be a positionless player. Sometimes he'll go to corner. There, were, uh, so Derwin's first game. My bad. I'll, I'll go back to this. Derwin's first game. I don't want to miss this. Uh, he was playing safety. He looked like he was going to blitz. They were playing the Kansas City Chiefs. He looks like he's going to blitz. He ends up backpedaling. And Tyreek Hill's wide open in the end zone. And Tyreek, you could see, he was getting ready. He's like, oh, I'm going to get this and I'm going to be good. Derwin comes out of nowhere, smacks the ball out of his, like, out of the air. And he, um, and he falls to the ground or whatever. And he gets up and he goes like that. Yeah. I'm like, crap, this kid is, he's something else. Then he goes and he sacks. The only sack of the game was him sacking Patrick Mahomes. And I'm like, oh, crap, I'm like this kid might be something. And then I see him that whole season. And I'm like, damn. So, I mean, I really feel like the football gods took away for us media getting able to see Derwin and, and really him continue to, to grow. Cause that, so the, the two years before where he got hurt uh, against New Orleans in the preseason, in the preseason and training camp, he was covering Michael Thomas a lot of the time mm -hmm. and man, was that impressive. 
So I'm I I think Brandon Saley needs to use him as a positionless player. Sometimes use him at corner. But I'm very excited because I mean people people get on me for saying this, but I'll say it. I mean I'm not scared. I feel like he's one of the only guys that can cover Travis Kelsey straight up one on one. There was a couple of, when the Chargers were twelve and four. They played Kansas City in Kansas City. You probably remember this game. It was a Thursday night game um, where the Chargers were able to come back and beat them. There was a play right before the Chargers came back. It was Derwin against uh, uh, Kelsey. Kelsey just does a quick drag route out to the side. And Patrick Mahomes hits him. It's a third and three. And you think, oh, he's going to pick this up easily. Derwin comes up, grabs him, picks him up, and just drops him. And I'm like, oh, crap. I'm like, this kid is, he's for real. Like, and, and, Dur- and I looked at the numbers, and Travis Kelsey, when Derwin James is on the field, and we've only had a small sample size. It's only been t- t- three games. In all three of those games, he hasn't scored a single touchdown, and he hasn't put up more than, I think, 50 receiving yards in those games. So Derwin, and you know what? Drew Tranquil is also going to get a hand in, in covering these tight ends. But definitely, I feel like um, I feel like Derwin James is going to be – he's going to put his hat and his stamp back in the NFL and say, hey, I am the best, not just uh, safety in the league. I'm the best defensive player in the league, and I feel like he's really going to show it. Derwin won't say it. He's not – him and Jalen Ramsey are big brother and little brother. Jalen will tell you he's the best defensive player. And, uh, and I mean, he is credit to everything that he's done and everything that he has done, but Derwin is just going to show you, he's not going to tell you. So Mm -hmm. that's really, um, it's going to be really impressive to see the way Derwin and, uh, and Joey and the, and the defense really try and take that next step with Brandon Staley. Cause I'm honestly, it's going to be very interesting to see the way Brandon Staley puts this all together, uh, next year. They're game wreckers. They're game wreckers. That's yeah. how I like to call them. No, oh, yeah, Dory Jackson. Better, yeah. Dory Jackson would be solid too. But you know, it's funny. I I truly think that um, I truly think that the Chargers are gonna be. I think right off the gate. I <laughs> this is the funny part. I was telling my brother about this. Um, I truly think that the Chargers and because last year we got cheated from Justin Herbert and Patrick Mahomes because we got the first game, but that was Justin's first game. Mm-hmm. So you really didn't get to see Justin and him go back and forth. You didn't get to see it at the end of the season because Andy Reid decided to sit his starters. Now, I think the Sunday night game or Monday night game for this year to open up the season, I feel like it's going to be Justin against Patrick. And if you can have – with how dynamic that Kansas City Chiefs offense is, if you can have Kyle Fuller on your defense as your corner – Man, you really – you and with Derwin back and with Joey 100%, with Kenneth there, all that, like you really could be one of the top defenses and you already have a top offense in the NFL. So you could really take that, put it all together and really be able to um, to maybe get closer to trying and winning the division uh, again. Yeah, let's shock the Chiefs week one. I'd be down for that. I don't want to see any I more don't. talk of Deshaun Watson in Denver or Russell Wilson in Las Vegas. That would just be the worst thing that's ever happened. I think, I, I think I, you know, <laughs> okay. And now I have to ask you, uh, uh, well, Joe, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Did it scare John Gruden that Russell Wilson wanted to go there because of the offensive line? Cause sh- he got rid of all those. <laughs> offensive yeah. Lines. He was like, yeah, yeah we don't have an offensive line over here. What are you talking <laughs> about? You see that picture. They're like, Oh, this is why Russell Wilson wants to go to the Raiders. And it's the whole offensive line blocking. But now you look at that picture and there's only Richie incognito left and uh, Colton Miller. They literally got rid of that whole right side of that offensive line. Yeah, uh, I think I think because it's funny because I posted that same picture on my Instagram and I was like, look, Trent Brown wasn't in this. And nobody was in there. But you know what? They're making moves after they got rid of Gabe Jackson. And oh, Trent um, Brown wasn't in there. My bad then. No, but Colton Miller was. Yeah, he was, okay. Trent Brown wasn't in that one. But, uh, you know, they brought in uh, Nick Martin what, from the from Houston, who's only given up one sack in the last couple of years. So they're, they're making the moves. But at first, when you're when you trade the Rodney Hudson, who I think is one of the best centers in the league, and it's just like. What are you doing? But yeah, it's just uh, Trent Brown. I wasn't worried about because he's he's only played uh, a couple games in the last couple of years, so he's been and missing. That's, you know, you got. I feel like a lot of people fall for the whole Brady or the whole Patriot thing, and when the Patriots, uh, when they those offensive linemen leave the Patriots, it's not the same thing. And I mean, that's why the whole Joe Tooney to the Chiefs, he, he might be really good, but sometimes I question it just because of. Uh, I feel like the the Patriots put a special disguise 
all over their offensive linemen. <laughs> and really when they leave, it's like, oh, wow, what happened? It all unraveled. So, um, but no, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. And let me, uh, let me ask you, since we're on the topic of quarterbacks right now, yeah. let's talk about one of the guys who, who uh, is a legend. He was a legend in San Diego. I'll say he's a legend. Cause I, I think he was a great man. I think he's a great quarterback and I always hated playing him and, but I always watched him everywhere he goes. 16 years for the Chargers organization. Then he went to the Colts last year. Phillip Rivers is finally hanging it up. Uh, how do Charger fans feel about Phillip Rivers still? I feel like Charger fans love Phillip Rivers. I feel like they really love what he brought to their organization. He gave them passion. He really gave uh, everything he had on the field, left everything he had on the field. And I feel like Charger fans loved him. I, I noticed that a lot of Charger fans followed the Colts last year. So they were really hoping that uh, Phillip was able to beat, upset the, you know what? And and honestly, they I thought they were going to beat the Bills at one point. I was like, oh crap, like they might beat the Buffalo, but just dumb mistakes happened uh, and they weren't able to take full advantage of it. But um, but fans kind of wanted to see Philip go out with a Super Bowl ring and unfortunately it wasn't able to happen for them. But I think fans are excited to see when Philip gets his jersey retired. I wouldn't be surprised if, if, the, if the NFL and attendance is back this year at like 100%. I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if the Chargers decided to retire his jersey this year. He was on the Nick Hardwick podcast, and he said that he um, he said that he already talked to John Spanos, who's the son of Dean Spanos, and that they were going to do a uh, give him give him a one day contract and have him retire as a Charger. So it's really going to be interesting to see um, if obviously if fans are back at one hundred percent. I I'm sure they're going to retire the jersey this year, but fans really want to have they really want fans there for that moment just because of everything Philip did with the organization, with the team and everything. So, um, so like I said, the chargers loved Philip rivers, Philip rivers, loved the chargers fans love Philip rivers. But the thing is that I feel like a lot of fans are now, and I'm not saying that they're turning on Philip or anything, but I'm saying, I think Justin has really gained the respect and the love that the chargers fans had for Philip rivers. Now, Justin's starting to win a lot of them over with his play and with some of the stuff that he did off the field. Um, I mean, if you guys want me to discuss that, I can tell you. Like, to me, it's impressive what Justin was able to do last year. Yes, on the field, mm -hmm. but off the field, he was able to to gain a um, – how do I want to put this? He was able to gain love and admiration from the organization, from the from fans without even fans being in attendance, without fans even getting to know him, without fans even being able to see him live unless you went to the Miami Dolphins game or the Denver Broncos game where they had fans, but a lot of fans gained love for him because of not even his play, but like the whole brisket thing. I don't know if, how closely uh, Joe, you paid attention, but I know that a lot of Charger fans love the whole bris brisket aspect. So the Chargers won a game and Justin put uh, a brisket and he said, oh, for the win last night or whatever, or the win yesterday on Instagram. Well, that was a snowball effect and fans started loving victory brisket Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> and Ju and Justin decided to run with it, and it turned into a whole new thing. I think Traeger Farms now sponsors him, so now he's turned this into a whole thing. But Charger fans love that about him. So literally, it's impressive to see the way Justin was able to connect with fans without even seeing them, without them knowing about him. But I think Justin is really connected with them. And I talked to him, and he told me, going back to the whole Philip Rivers thing, that he really wants to talk to Philip. He wants to. He wants to get some knowledge from Philip, and he actually spoke to him. My bad, I forgot about that. So he told me that Shane Steichen, uh, who was the Chargers offensive coordinator last year, that he um, he he communicated or he kind of connected Philip and him, and he was able to tell him, "Hey, I was a huge fan growing up. I loved watching you play quarterback." And he asked Philip for advice. Philip gave him advice. So that's really what impressed me about Justin. And I know you asked me about Philip. But Justin really is trying to reach out to different quarterbacks and he's trying to learn as much as he can, which is really impressive. I'm telling you, this kid's a sponge. Like he's so smart. He's trying to learn more and more. So I, I honestly, I, I think the Chargers have really landed the best quarterback. And don't be surprised if in a couple of years, Justin is start is being thrusted into that Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson conversation. I think it could even happen this year. Um, at, at that point 
All right, we we had a we had a run. Fernando had to take off on us. He had a, an important phone call. You know that's what it is when you work for Sports Illustrated and he's a Chargers reporter. You never know what's going to go on. So I appreciate the time that he gave us. If you're a Charger fan, you have to be excited of everything that he said. He put out a lot of good information right there. Even if you're not a Charger fan, like I'm sitting here as a Raider fan, going, "Dang, you got me believing in the Chargers right now." <laughs> like I, I appreciate everything that Fernando uh, Fernando Ramirez said at Real F. Ramirez on Twitter. You guys can check him out. Like I said, he's a Charger reporter for Sports Illustrated. And Mike, I don't know. What would you think? That was a good time. That was a good time. It's good to hear all the positives going on behind the scenes with the Chargers. Definitely a more behind the scenes look at it. This this will be shared on the Chargers fan page. So if you came from there, make sure you hit the subscribe and notification bell while you're here for more Chargers talk. I'm gonna bring it up on every episode in the history of the Warzone Sports Network. I might even start sabotaging Sports Force and just heading over there and just popping in real quick. Hey, you guys want to talk about Justin Herbert? Okay, I'm gonna go. Maybe that maybe that'll spark something. Well, like I said, I mean Charger talk. I, when I booked them, I text you right away and I was like, I'm throwing <laughs> you a bone, Mike. I don't like talking Chargers, but I'm throwing you a bone. I got somebody for you to come on the show. Hey, and it turned out to be a great a great episode, and I I loved everything he was saying. And uh, hey, he's welcome back anytime. He entered the war zone. He's welcome back every time. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I would appreciate uh, just the inside information, the stories that he has about that organization was awesome. And we got into some WWE, and you know how we love WWE. But you guys are watching the War Zone Sports Network. This is Joe Mori. I'm Mike. Or, I'm not Mike on the mic. That's Mike on the mic. I own Mike on the mic on Friday Night Wars. Oh. If you guys watch that one. Um, and you guys also, we have Sports Force on Wednesday night with Brian Bolser and Joe Scudero. 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 So I, make sure I just want to bring up also, it seems like Justin Herbert is on the mind. Not just my mind. Everyone's mind. Justin Herbert got people talking last year, guys. Justin Herbert got people talking. Uh, just like we got you guys talking. You guys hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, share this with all your friends and friends because the War Zone Sports Network is bringing you great episodes just like the one you just watched. You're doing great, Joe. I just want to let you know that. Yeah. Mike, let's end this because I'm getting ready to see you on Friday night.